There's very little question that the subject of dealing with the devil has become a religion of its own in our generation. In fact, in many circles, the lordship of Christ has been eclipsed or at least given co-billing with this issue of concentrating on the dangers of demons. And the focus of many fellowships has shifted from resting in the power of God to resisting the power of the enemy. To some, at least, satanic undertones lie beneath the surface of virtually every passage of Scripture. And the key to victory in the Christian life, then, rests simply in learning to find the enemy and bind the enemy. Satan gets the blame and gets the credit, therefore, for virtually every catastrophe, every problem, every inconvenience, and every sickness in life. And what happens is he begins to appear front and center on the stage of life. So the living God must move quietly into the background, awaiting his cue to appear for some major battle, confront the enemy in some miraculous form. But you see, the end result is that Satan becomes the star of the show. And God has to simply wait in the wings for an opportunity to do something dramatic. The fruits of such a theology often include a kind of paranoia in the life of the Christian who's frantically looking over his shoulder for the entrance and effects of the demonic host. But at the other, that's not a very victorious existence, that's to be sure. But at the other end of the spectrum, there are those who simply deny that such a person as the devil exists, that he's not real. They say there's just an evil force at work in this world. They deny the acknowledgement that he, Satan possesses the attributes of personality, that he has any real authority, or that he has access to the heart of the child of God. And sad to say, many seminaries are actually teaching this kind of blasphemy. So while both extremes generate problems, the latter is far the more dangerous of the two. For whenever you deny the existence of an enemy, my friends, you in effect you're surrendering to that enemy any time he decides to attack. The scripture, on the other hand, give us a very balanced picture of Satan. He's described in great detail, but always to give us an understanding of his tactics rather than an awesome fear of his power. At every turn, we are admonished to be aware of his authority, but to be more aware of the far greater authority of the indwelling Christ. In fact, nearly every time you see the power of Satan mentioned in the New Testament, it is mentioned to draw attention to the power of God. Now you remember that. The word of God is not a harbinger of fear, for God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind, 2 Timothy 1 7. So I will approach this lesson this morning with great caution. Our purpose is not to generate attention for the evil one. Our purpose is to draw attention to the remarks Jesus made about the evil one and the glory and we recruit to God as we become aware of how the evil one operates, so that we can live in the sheer victory that is ours in Christ. Before we begin, let's stop to establish a few ground rules about Satan, who he is and what he does. In case you didn't know, Satan is real. He was a trusted angel before the fall, Isaiah 14, 12, Luke 10, 18. And, and since the fall, he has assumed the role of the adversary of God, 1 Timothy 5, 14. You may not have time to look up all these verses now, but they're listed in your notes, and you can look them up when you get home. He has all of the attributes of a spirit being, the Scripture teaches. He possesses great intellect, great reason, and great ability to express himself. He's not a vague essence of evil that cannot be defined. He's a real person with a real set of objectives. Very real. Secondly, here come those objectives. As the enemy of God, he has a twofold goal. One, he wants to prevent unbelievers from coming to Christ, Luke 8, 12. Two, he wants to render Christians ineffective. He wants to stop your testimony and stop your witness. He doesn't want the multiplication process to go on. He doesn't want you to enjoy your victory in Christ, and he doesn't want you to win others to Christ, Luke twenty-two thirty-one. Now, he has thousands of tactics. We all know that. But today's lesson is going to focus in on primarily on one, which I believe to be his most devastating one, which Jesus spoke of in this parable in great detail. Fact number three, he has access to God for the purpose of accusing you, of accusing me. Job chapter one, as a spirit being, he's allowed to approach the throne of God to make accusations against the saints 
thus allowing God to take the test Satan has devised to destroy us and use him instead to transform us. Number four, he actually roams the earth looking for Christians to destroy. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Satan roams to and fro like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen a lion out looking for lunch or not. But it's not akin to someone taking a casual drive through the countryside. It's a calculated hunt. It's an aggressive aggressor stalking his prey, moving through the brush unnoticed until at precisely the right moment he springs through the air and captures the unsuspecting delicacy he longs for. That's the mindset of Satan. Number five, his ultimate destruction is a foredrawn conclusion in Scripture. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41, and many other references. He and his demonic host will ultimately be totally defeated by the armies of God, will be banished first for a thousand years, and then for an eternity of unending torment and punishment. He is a convicted criminal on death row awaiting execution. At any time God chooses, Satan's reign on earth is finished. The king will come in great splendor to crush the serpent beneath his feet. And it's not a maybe, it's a must. It's never if, it's only when. Number, nine, number six, now listen. The scripture does not tell us to fight with Satan. In fact, it tells us not to. Second Chronicles 20.15 gives us the perfect illustration. It says the battle is not ours, it's God's. Set yourselves. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Ephesians six eleven. we are to put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And I believe herein lies one of the great lies that Satan himself has sold to the church. He has attempted to make us the aggressors in the battle. Stalking out the enemy, attacking the enemy, attempting to destroy the enemy. And he loves it because the, when we go on the attack, we, are, we become outside the will and the authority of God and he is a fielder. Our God is able to deliver us. That's the key. We have no need to fight in this battle. Seventhly then, we are not to attack Satan. We are to resist Satan. Peter goes on. Be sober. Be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith. First Peter 5, 8. We are told in Ephesians 6, 13 to stand, and having done all, to stand. Ours is a defensive position, and for a very good reason. Principle number eight. The way we resist the devil, and this is the key, is by crawling up into the arms of Jesus. So we read in James 4, 7, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Thus resist the devil, and he will promise, flee from you. Here's how you resist. Draw nigh unto God, and he'll draw nigh unto you. You do not defeat Satan on the battlefield, my friend. God does. You do not defeat Satan, period. Your God defeats Satan when you make Jesus the total object of your trust in your life. When you lay yourself at his feet and ask God to defend you, he becomes your rock, your shield, and your salvation. When you withdraw from his arms and try to do battle with the enemy on your own, you launch out into enemy territory asking for defeat. His is the kingdom. His is the power. His is the glory. Therefore, the battle belongs to him. Now, you may say that's only an issue of semantics, but my friend, it's not. It's an issue of authority. And finally, number nine, the scriptures clearly define that while resisting the devil involves drawing nigh unto God, we must know how to draw nigh unto God. And drawing nigh unto God, among other things, involves using his word. When you lay up the word in your heart, beloved, and the enemy attacks you, you all you have to do then, if provided the word is there, is to make a minute-by-minute -minute choice whether you're going to listen to what John 10, 5 calls the voice of the stranger, or whether you're going to listen to the voice of the Word of God. Which voice you listen to will determine whether or not you're resisting the devil. If the Word is laid up in your heart, and that's a big if, and immediately upon attack you turn to the Word, the devil always flees. He cannot tolerate the Scriptures. He, his, he, it is the only weapon used in Ephesians chapter 6, and it is the only weapon Jesus used in Matthew chapter 4. The Word of God. He cannot cope with it. 
So is it any wonder he fights so hard to keep us from the Word and the Word from us? And that's what today's lesson is all about. We have been, you may remember, looking at Jesus' rather detailed explanation of the, what the rest of his teaching ministry was going to be like. And he began by telling a very simple story. And then he told the disciples why he told them a story. And then he explained, proceeds to explain the story so that they might come to understand not only that story, but all the stories he was going to tell for the rest of his ministry. He began by explaining the cast of characters, you remember, and explaining the key element in the story was the Word of God. The seed is the Word. And then he explained that the sower sows the Word. That's us. Your job, my job, as possessors of the seed, is to take the seed and cast it into the various types of soil we will come in contact with. <clears throat> and now Jesus begins to explain what will happen when we do that. And it's at this point that he introduces another ingredient in the story. It's a person. And this person is characterized by, the, by, the, uh, by a swooping bird who, like a vulture, seeks to snatch away the seed before it can ever take root and produce a crop. And he clearly tells us who the character is and why the character does what he does. First, we'll look at the illustration, then the explanation. First, the illustration, Matthew 13, 4. When he sowed the sower... Some seeds fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them up. And then in Matthew thirteen nineteen, we get the explanation very clearly. Jesus said, I want to explain to you what I just said. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom, anyone hears the word, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, the birds of the air, and he catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. And this is he that received the seed by the wayside. Now, our outline for this lesson, then, will be simple. Part one is the illustration. Part two, the explanation. Part three, some assumptions. And then, finally, the application. Now, Jesus has very definitively drawn a word picture on the tablets of Scripture here to illustrate one of the most overlooked principles in the church. It's the principle of the, the role of man, the role of God, and the role of Satan in the process of taking in and applying the Word of God. And he decides to use a parable. You remember, a parable is a story cast alongside. A simple story about recognizable, understandable experiences that when interpreted by the Holy Spirit reaches into the life of the Christian and etches indelibly into our hearts a precept about the process of truth. Now this illustration, of course, is a picture of a farmer. <clears throat> farmer walking along a pathway, casting seeds as he goes, with the specific intent of growing and harvesting a crop. He has a goal. But as the farmer sows, it becomes immediately evident, one, that not all of the seed is going to bear fruit. Two, it becomes evident quickly that not much of the seed is going to bear fruit. But three, it becomes evident that the key is the seed that does take root is what matters, for those seeds will multiply themselves, some as many as a hundredfold. So the farmer can live with the wasted seed, for the one who makes the seed to grow will see that the ones that fall on fertile soil more than make up for those that are lost. Now, Jesus, however, was obviously concerned with the ones that got away, the seed that got away, for he dedicates his whole parable to explaining what happened. And he draws word pictures of three things that happen when, that are not good. When the seed is sown. Today's lesson deals with the first of those three. It's about the seed sown by the wayside. The seed that falls by the side of the road where the soil's not ready yet to receive it. Of course, what makes this illustration so powerful is the explanation that follows. We've already learned the seed represents the word of God and the sower, that's us, has a primary function and that's to sow the seed in season and out of season to continually sow the seed of the word. Now there enters into the story this second character, a very real character. In Matthew, he's called the wicked one. In the Mark account, he's referred to as Satan. In the Luke account, he's referred to as the devil. So we don't really have to use our imaginations, do we? <clears throat> Jesus is referring to Satan. And what Jesus is saying is very simply this. Now listen, whenever, whenever the word goes forth, the enemy goes forth as well. That's what he's saying. In fact, the true meaning of the phrase is, at the same time the sower is sowing, 
the birds are swooping. Satan is descending, preparing to snatch it away, lest it take root and bear spiritual fruit. Like a roaring lion, like a swooping bird, he descends. Now, Jesus makes some assumptions in his explanations here that we need to examine. In case you haven't noticed, one of the most overlooked sources of instruction in the Word of God are the, are the uh, things that Jesus simply assumes to be true. We've already seen this over and over, and the assumptions in this passage are powerful. We need to stop long enough to remind ourselves of them. Number one, Jesus simply assumes we'll be sowing. The sower sows the Word. When he sowed, as he sowed, this, this story begins. It's a foregone conclusion. Secondly, Jesus assumes, now listen, Jesus assumes some of the seed will fall by the wayside. It's obvious the seed is valuable. You don't simply waste it intentionally. The parable or the story of casting pearl before swine teaches us a great deal about the value of the word in the presence of scoffers, but this passage teaches us much about the other side of the coin. It's an assumption. Jesus is assuming that when you sow the seed, some will not fall on good soil. And as you are sowing, you cannot always tell the difference. <clears throat> so many become discouraged as they teach or as they disciple or as they preach or as they witness because they just can't see response. And those whose hearts they were just sure were fertile soil turn out to have ears that cannot hear. And the temptation, beloved, is to give up or to change fields. Be careful. It is a scriptural assumption that some of the seed will not grow. And one reason is that some of the seed will be snatched up by the enemy before it's ever appropriated. <clears throat> the third assumption is that the birds will come. The enemy will, without fail, be there whenever the seed is sown. And he's going to be after the seed so it cannot take root. Always he comes, always. Now, if there's one thing Satan is, it's consistent, painfully consistent. His tactics do not vary a great deal, but unfortunately, they, always, they often seem to work. The seed snatcher always comes. You can bank on it. As you sit today listening to the Word, reading the Word, the seed snatcher is waiting. It's not a possibility. It's an assumption. Fourthly, there's one more assumption. It is assumed that some will not understand. <clears throat> now, the word understand here literally comes from a word that means to bring together after consideration. It means knowledge thought through. You may recall from some earlier studies that knowledge is nothing more than facts placed in the mind. Understanding is the personalization of those facts. Wisdom is the appropriation of those facts. And always when the word goes forth, the scripture says, some do not understand. Some don't grasp that the principles are personal. There may be an intellectual assent to the information, but no personal responsibility or conviction. And so as Hebrews 4.2 so graphically describes, the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith by them that heard it. So, Jesus assumes four things before he begins. One, he assumes the word will go forth. It will be sown. Two, he assumes some seed will fall by the side of the road. Three, he assumes the enemy will be waiting. And four, he assumes some will hear everything said and everything read, but will not understand the truth will not be mixed with faith. Now, those four assumptions set the parameters for the story. That's the illustration, the explanation, the assumption. So, of course, always the question is, what's the application? How would this parable or this portion of the parable affect the disciples? Or more important, how will it affect us? Let's look. First of all, it ought to affect our evangelism. Now, the Matthew passage says this, When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and he catcheth away that which was sown in the heart. The Mark account says, And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown, and when they have heard, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. The Luke passage says, however, says this, Those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil. And he taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. 
You see, evangelism, my friend, is more than preaching. It is more than teaching. It is more than witnessing. It is more than living the life. It is all of those, but much more. Evangelism is praying. Evangelism is involvement. Evangelism is the process of sowing the seed, then nurturing the seed, and protecting the seed by watching the sky as the enemy, like the birds of the air, swoops down into the heart of the one into whom the seed's been planted and literally tries to take it away. You've experienced it. You've shared Christ with a friend or a relative or a neighbor or a business associate. And you've seen the, 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 the power of conviction descend on that life. Awareness take hold. You've seen what appears to be a receptiveness to the gospel. They weren't ready to say yes to Christ, but they were ready to consider saying yes. And you went home rejoicing, praising God. This person was at the edge of the kingdom. A little time passes, maybe just a day. You make contact again with this once receptive near convert of yours, only to your amazement to find no evidence of interest, no sensitivity to truth, no openness to additional input, nothing. You've had it happen. What happened? You sowed the word. Then came the seed snatcher. He swooped down like a hawk, and the minute your back was turned, he snatched away the seed, and it never took root. You may have been with someone at a graveside or in a hospital room, and under great emotional trauma, you shared the word, and, and they shared that from this moment on, they would live for Christ. But two or three days later, you meet them again. The, the crisis is over. There's no evidence of transformation. There's no hunger for the Word. There's no conviction of sin. There's no sensitivity to truth. And you ask yourself, what happened? Well, they may have intended to be different. But they perhaps didn't understand. That is, they didn't fully grasp personally the reality of salvation. So the seed laid there at the edge of their heart, waiting to gain entrance. And then came the seed snatcher. Like a vulture, he took away the seed of the word. So conversion never really took place. You see, understanding this parable then ought to affect our concept of the process of evangelism. First of all, we must not assume they understand. The word understand, remember, means to have personalized truth. A man or woman can understand that Christ died for the sins of the world, for instance, but if he does not understand, if she does not understand that Christ died for his sins, for her sins, and that their responsibility is to say yes or no, the word didn't take root. The seed snatcher will come. Not might, will. Jesus guaranteed it. We must not assume then because a person demonstrated interest that they grasp truth. Secondly, we must not leave someone we consider to be a new convert to themselves. As someone has so appropriately said, we mustn't baptize them and leave them on the banks to dry. We wouldn't think of bringing a child into the world in the physical realm and then just leaving them on a table and going about our business and saying, we've got to remember to check up on them in a week or two. Too many enemies out there just waiting to claim that life. Well, why then are we so careless or so carefree about someone who prays or appears to be praying to receive Christ? Now, they may not have quite understood. We don't know. Or they may be needing only a touch of encouragement or a question answered. But if someone desires and indica indicates a desire, beloved, to receive Christ, you take them to raise, at least for a time, or see that somebody else does. Anything else is presumption. Sure, the seed went forth, but then came the seed snatcher. And the responsibility belongs to the spiritual parent to nurture, to care for that spiritual infant, be sure that life really exists and that that child begins to grow. Secondly, this parable ought to affect the way we study the Word. It ought to affect the way we receive the Word in Sunday school class, in church, or in our own personal study. It ought to affect the way we respond to any truth from the Word of God. Now, even today, it is possible that you have been convicted of some spiritual truth from the Scriptures. And you know that God was speaking to you. 
Now, what are you going to do about it? You have a choice. You can take that truth to the point of understanding. You can assign a day this week, preferably tomorrow, to meditate on that passage, to make a, a, yourself accountable to God or to someone else to help you work through that situation. Or you can give in to the seed snatcher. You mean well, but you can return next week and the pastor or a teacher or someone teach on the same thing and you get convicted of the same thing and you wonder, what happened? Nothing happened. I'll tell you why. You heard the Word and considered it. And you planned to turn it into understanding. But then came the seed snatcher. And he took the Word lying there just waiting to be drawn into your life and he swooped down and he snatched it up and it's gone. My friend, if you plant, you'll have to plant it again if you want it to grow. When you get alone with God and open His Word tomorrow, do you, will you pray, Lord, make this truth come alive to me personally, and when He does, will you stop and do something about it? Or will you, like me, just assume that once you've taken in the seed, it's just got to bear fruit? My friend, it doesn't. And Jesus just told us why there's a seed snatcher out there whose whole aim is to watch and wait for the seed to be sown. And then just as it begins to accomplish its purpose, he descends and he steals and he leaves you with nothing to change your life. That's why there's an assignment at the end of each of these lessons. If you and I don't take whatever it is God's dealing with us about and take a few days to meditate on it and work it into our lives, the seed snatcher comes. And he steals the seed. So pray as you begin to study. And pray as the pastor begins to preach. And pray as the teacher begins to teach. And pray as that convert begins to respond. Pray understanding the enemy. Not fearing the enemy. Understanding him. He's a seed snatcher. And what he wants to do is take the word away from you before it ever accomplishes God's goal. Pray then that God would envelop your heart with a cover of love and protect the seed until it sinks graciously into the soil of your heart. And then pray that God would enable you to go immediately back to that field and water the seed, nurture the seed until the seed grows. You know what happens when you do? The angels in heaven begin to sing anthems of praise. And you know why? They saw what happened. They saw that the word went forth and lodged in your heart, and then came the seed snatcher. But as the seed snatcher came, the seed could not be found, because it was already lodged forever in the depths of your heart. And so the seed snatcher returned to the sky empty handed. And the angels sang a chorus of joy as you went your way, transformed by the power of the living God. So take the word into your heart and guard it there with care. For there is yet an enemy who longs to enter there. He longs to steal away the seed. He rushes in right to it. But you and I still hold the key. We mustn't let him do it. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we love you. May we not be wasters of the seed of the word. May we rather take it, protect it, cover it, make it grow. So that when the seed snatcher comes, he'll go away empty-handed. In Jesus' name, amen. You've been listening to a message by Russell Kelfer founder and director of Discipleship Tape Ministries of San Antonio, Texas. Feel free to contact us on the World Wide Web at www.dtm.org. That's dtm.org. Or you may write to us at the following address, Discipleship Tape Ministries, 10602 Moss Bank, San Antonio, Texas, and the zip is 78230. Well, thank you for listening. We pray God's richest blessing may be yours as he continues to live his life in you.
The lesson you're about to hear is designed to help you apply God's Word to your daily life in a very practical way. Our teacher is the late Russell Kelford of the Into His Likeness radio program. Russell taught Bible classes for over 20 years and was founder of Discipleship Tape Ministries of San Antonio, Texas. His messages continue to be distributed around the world free of charge by way of compact disc, audio cassette, and print. For additional copies or a listing of all available lessons, feel free to contact us on the World Wide Web at www.dtm.org or call us toll free at 1-800-375-7778. Or you may write to us at Discipleship Tape Ministries, 10602 Moss Bay, San Antonio, Texas, 78230. We pray God will touch your heart as you listen.